All right. Uh, Lisa Genevieve here with Bottom Line and another episode of our Evolutionary Leaders series. As you all know, Evolutionary Leaders was born from wanting to celebrate those brands that are evolving, challenging the status quo. And our next interview is with Ryan Johnson, President at, and CEO at Whipcord. Ryan was recognized by Alberta Venture Magazine as one of the 13 leaders of the next generation and again in 2012 as one of Alberta's 50 most influential people. So I'm pretty excited for you all to meet him. So welcome, Ryan. Great. Thank you very much. So let's start off by you telling us what is Whipcord? Well, Whipcord is actually sort of two companies in one. Um, we have a data center um, infrastructure that we're using to support a bunch of Canada or companies in Western Canada and it's uh, everything that you would expect in a data center a tier three facility and we offer a cloud solutions and network or what we're focused on there and we've got some really great customers there um, in the past we've supported space agencies from around the world the German space agency the French space agency we worked with KSAT who supports um, many space programs around the world so our infrastructure is is world class, and now we're leveraging that same infrastructure to support um, companies in, in Western Canada. On the other side, we're involved in agriculture, and we have deep roots in agriculture, sort of a pun there, I guess. We actually started the company many, many, many years ago, and my first project ever was actually trying to correlate the yield of potatoes to satellite imagery. So I actually started with gumboots in a field. Um, the the company we had before, we grew our, our business uh, into a global enterprise where we did business um, in over 100 countries around the world. We had partners in 85 countries, and the vast majority of our business was focused on either agriculture or forestry. Uh, agriculture is really a passion of ours. So now we're focused on applications that really follow smart tractors. So we're writing the software now that optimize what these really smart tractors are doing in the field. And we can see significant margin improvements for the farmers. And it's a neat opportunity because it's an application that we could push global uh, quite quickly again. Very, very cool. And I've um, been lucky enough to work with you guys on, on some of this. And it's been pretty fascinating to see how quickly, especially well, both sides of the business, but the agriculture side has been just like exponentially growing. Yeah, we're, very, we're excited about that. And the, the big advantage for us is that we can leverage a lot of our past relationships that took years and years to, to grow. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting thing because agriculture is seasonal, um, like we were just talking about that, you know, all the farmers are busy planting right now in, in Canada, but in other parts of the world, they're just getting uh, ramped up and ready to go, which is the great time for us to, to engage our sales activities in those regions. So it's back to what we were before 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, <laughs> but it's fun. That's awesome. And uh, for those that are listening in, uh, the product on the agriculture side, uh, can you share with us like what it's called? Sure. It's called First Pass. And really what we do is we write software that interacts with the guidance packages on the tractors. And we use machine learning to optimize the routes that those tractors take. And when we first looked at the problem, we thought there'd be really significant changes that the tractors would have to follow a different path. But honestly, sometimes it can be as little as moving a tractor over six inches as it starts its, its path, um, can have significant chain or improvements. And we've actually shown for farmers margin improvements as high as, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent increased money that they get to keep in their, their pockets. And we certainly know the stress that farmers are on nowadays. So it's a, it's a significant improvement for sure. Absolutely. And I know you highlighted a bit of this on the seasonality side of things, but um, you're not just in Western Canada, but that's where you guys started with this product. But uh, what other markets are you guys in? Uh, right now, we um, we are talking to distributors in Australia and Brazil. Uh, we've had a lot of experience in Brazil. It's been a very strong market for us in the, in the past. Um, building partnerships in Brazil is always really important because doing in Brazil, none of us speak Portuguese to start with, but <laughs> also the legal system and then how you bid and so forth there is, is really important to have deep partnerships. Um, so we're working on that and we've got some trials happening with farmers, which is, is great. Uh, Australia is another big market for, for us. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. Um, next, we'll move into um, Europe and then likely the CIS probably in, in that order. Fantastic. And on the cloud side of things, I also understand you guys have a data center here in Lethbridge. 
and you have right. an office here in Calgary. So it's it's mostly centered around Alberta. Is the cloud based services is that correct? Right. So the the cloud based services the the focus there is really Western Canada. Um, most of our customers are really particular about the latency that the the services have. So we have to be reasonable close to our our customers. But we're working with some very large enterprises where we're standing up. Uh, private clouds for for them or hybrid clouds um, where they're basically taking a lot of their workload and moving it into the public clouds and then we're still storing those pieces that that don't fit either from a technology standpoint or a data uh, management perspective we keep those those pieces okay that makes makes good sense um and when it comes to like other companies that you guys are kind of going up against on we'll talk cloud side and then we can talk the egg side um in a second what are you guys doing that's really different in the cloud space that's different than than your competitors that's a good question i think in the the cloud space um there's lots of really big players that are in the, the cloud space for example we always get compared to the the public clouds um often Oftentimes, there's many companies, even big, sophisticated companies, that the step away from what they've been doing traditionally into a public cloud environment is a scary, scary process. I understand. <laughs> uh, so we really, we really handhold those big customers through that process and help them through that that migration. And it's not like you can flip a switch and go from on premise to all public cloud. There's always leftover things. So as they're trying to reduce their infrastructure budgets, we're happy to take on those leftover sort of pieces that they need to, to manage. And oftentimes some of our competitors that are sort of the big telcos in, in Western Canada don't necessarily want those smaller pieces. It's not worth their sort of while to, to take on some of those harder to manage type uh, systems. We're happy to do that because what we really want to do is build super deep integrated relationships with our customers that last last for a very, very long, long time. That makes sense. And if we look at the egg side, and I know the answer to a lot of these questions, so I'm being a bit facetious, but um, when it comes to the egg side, you guys are very remarkable because I don't think that there's anybody else really doing what you do. No, it's, it's actually, we're in a, a, a neat position. So we acquired the, the IP from a company called First Pass. We've kept the, kept the brand name, but it truly is a white space opportunity. Um, when we first looked at it, my first, you know, your intuition is somebody has to be doing this. Um, it, the problem that we're solving didn't seem particularly complicated. The methodology to solve it is complicated, but we looked deeply into it and there's really not anyone doing what we're doing today, which is, is great from a company perspective. Um, but it's also an interesting thing. I don't think anyone's looked at the value that we're able to provide farmers with it. And it's a niche position for us. And there's a truly meaningful value proposition for the for our users, which is obviously, you know, those two things together always make for, for great outcomes. So that's very, very true. And I know that um, you have a, a bit of a history in the, the tech space in, in general. I'd love to hear how, how you got started in this space and maybe some of the lessons that you learned along the way growing this company. Uh, sure. Uh, well, our tech world has actually run for a long time. So we started a, a company close to two decades ago. That's crazy that we're that old, but anyways. Um, <laughs> Not old, just wise. <laughs> old, wise, yes. So, um, so when we started it, we really were um, focused on providing mapping services to our, our customers, what we're, we're focused on. And we were writing software to, to do a lot of things. So we've always been pretty software heavy. And we were licensing content from, from other people. Um, as our business started to grow, we were quite lucky because we were sort of in the boom days of the energy sector and we were doing lots of business there. So there was a lot of products that people were buying that were nice to have, not need to have, which is, you know, it was good for us to start a company at that time. Um, and as we did that, we started to basically manage satellite imagery for a whole bunch of energy sector companies it was really the nexus of where we started. Um, and then as we got more and more embedded into the customers, we sort of rode that wave, that wave of high oil energy prices. And then when it dropped, we learned in a heartbeat the difference between a nice to have product and a need to have product, which was pretty shocking. Um, but we really then sort of doubled down on those things that were actually creating real value for, for our customers. So we learned a big lesson there to understand deeply why a customer is buying a product. And I think that that's a really interesting thing that we still talk about today 
is to focus on those opportunities where you have deep knowledge about the vertical that you're going into. Because a lot of the things that we lost when the, the price came down were things that we we were building, like build it and they will come uh, mm-hmm. type things. And that we lost a lot of that and we sort of got owned on a lot of things on, on that thing. Mm-hmm. So really we focus on those industries where, you know, we're not the smartest guys in the room, but we know enough to ask the questions of the customer so we can deep, build deep relationships over, over time. And many of those relationships that we started two decades ago, uh, we've maintained to this to this day, which I think is pretty pretty powerful that we've been able to keep business relationships in the tech industry for over twenty years. Um, Absolutely. So I think that was one was one of the really big uh, lessons. Um, the other lesson I think that that I still harp on all the time is focus on growth markets. Um, we have lots of opportunities, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the difference between. Uh, Russia for us and Brazil, both of which are complex com- companies, countries rather to do business in, both from our past business had great opportunities for us. Everything we were selling lined up to the geography and the reason they should buy it and, and so forth. Um, and we'd spent many, many years selling it into to, to Russia. But the regulatory environment was just very complicated for us. And it was a really hard emotional thing to say no to Russia and double down on Brazil. Brazil was growing for us. It was easier to do business there. But, you know, g shucks it should have worked in Russia. We've tried so hard. Let's just try one more year in Russia, um, which just consumes resources and, and skill and lets people down. And then you start putting your really good te- you know, employees on that to try to solve those problems that are unsolvable. And it sucks energy and stuff away from the company. So make those hard decisions to focus on, on growth markets and say no to a lot of a lot of things. I, so I think so. those are two two good lessons. Yeah, it's uh, especially people that come from a very entrepreneurial mindset. It's hard sometimes to say no to that new shiny fun thing. It's, <laughs> uh, I have suffered from that many a time. <laughs> Huh. Um, awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing those, those lessons. What about when it comes to like the biggest misconception about what you do, either on the egg side or on the uh, cloud side? I think it's the oftentimes that people don't realize the, um, I think that the depth of knowledge we have, particularly in, in agriculture, we've been involved in agriculture for, for decades. Um, Wilson grew up on a farm. He actually drew, drove a tractor. Um, you know, so I think that that's pretty um, an important thing to understand about our company is often because it's shiny, people like to immediately jump into the technology discussions and so forth versus the actual business that we're, we're supporting. So we have really deep, deep knowledge of what needs to happen. We also have a very deep knowledge about how to do business around the world. Um, so I think those two things are are sort of you know, back of our mind all the time as we're, we're leveraging technology to do things. And also the order that we're going after markets. Um, I mentioned that we'll go into Europe in sort of a phase two strategy. Mm-hmm. That's because we understand all of the requirements to do business in Europe around data protection and so forth. It's something you can't just rush into without taking some steps there. Fair. On the data center side, I think um, we need to do a little bit better job about bragging about our past customers, to be to be honest. Uh, we've supported um, many, many awesome uh, customers that have operated assets in space. Um, in that area, it's not like there, there's sort of zero tolerance for, for failure in those, those environments. And we've been able to support those. Um, uh, we've supported... Uh, neat missions. Obviously, we can't go into all of that, but we've supported missions for space agencies um, and so forth. And they've they certainly grill you to make sure you know what you're doing in those those processes. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. So this is a super bold question that I've actually never asked in one of these interviews before. What are you most scared of? Well, all of my daughters are scary, so I don't know if that's <laughs> super personal. I think on the the business side, I think it's the shiny objects staying focused. Um, you know, we're starting again with this in the new venture. Um, so we're small, so we have to be quick and, and focused. I think that that's probably my biggest fear to today. I think as we start to grow, um, I think we'll feel particularly on the ag side, we're going to feel uh, a lot of, a lot of competition. Uh, we've, we've dealt with big industrial competition in the past, but those things are, are, are stresses always. Um, but I think right now it's focus 
And then it's how we're going to mitigate uh, the competition that comes quite quickly. Awesome. I really appreciate you sharing that. And it's one of the things that I admire so much about you guys is that although you have a product that nobody else is doing, and I mean, in reality, somebody else, one of these big players could move in and do it. You guys are fearless and you're going after it and you're not showing that, that scared piece. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Um, my last question for you is where are you guys headed in kind of the next 18 months and how are you going to achieve it? I think the, how we're going to achieve it is, um, really getting, building the right team. So you know, it, everyone loves to be sort of that visionary that says in 18 months, we're going to accomplish these five things. You know, we point an arrow in a direction, but never hit what we say we're going to do. But it's it's really around building that team. So as things change, we've got the team that can make smart decisions and adjust to where we're headed. And that's really what we spent a lot of time to do. So most of the key people in the company today, we've worked with for a long time. Um, so, for example, Goddard, who you've met multiple times uh, in our previous company, he ran our, our, our PMO, which was our project management office. So every complicated, hard problem that was you know required multiple vendors and multiple teams inside our company we gave it to to him to solve all those complex problems so he's very smart but he's also very very personable and that's a really hard role to have so he's joined us as uh, uh, chief operating officer Uh, wilson i've had a relationship with for probably a decade he was our external legal counsel and there's external legal counsels and then there's external legal counsels and he was the good ones um, so he really had a really deep knowledge about what we did and really took the time to understand our business. So when we met with with Wilson, it wasn't just, you know, please review this contract. It was also lots of meaningful input about how we could position this contract so that we could step being stone that into something else later on. And so he's always had lots of great insights into that. And in our new business with his ag background is just phenomenal. And then uh, Matt Mendez, who's joined us, um, has a tremendous background um, coming from Enbridge. He's built really big companies inside Enbridge and has done a tremendous amount of international businesses as well. So I think at that that level, um, I think there's a lot of trust in the team that's worked together in the past. But then even below that, we're starting to bring on the people that we've worked with and that we like to work with. Um, we often joke that we spend more time with our, our colleagues at work than our, than our wives. Um, so we, at this point in our, our careers, we get to pick who we want to work with. And so we're picking our, our friends and lucky, I'm super lucky. All of my friends are smarter than me. So that's good. So. <laughs> well, that is a good thing to look forward to. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. This was uh, cool to hear more about Whipcord. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah.